tonight it's i'm just gonna say tonight it's literally a dark and stormy night where i'm at so this is fantastic uh i'm <laughs> i want to say welcome to steve Bissett, uh to uh, the adventures in porte sci-fi fest so this is the first time this has happened i'm very excited about being a part of it so uh, you're Steve Bazette. Uh, just briefly, I'm Blake Smith uh, from the podcast Monster Talk, and I also do a podcast called In Research Of, where uh, a colleague of mine and I watch the uh, old TV show In Search Of and sort of add in the missing science. Wow. Yeah, it's a lot now, of fun. Now, have we not met before? I know, it's crazy. You know, and then this I, is like amazing. So, <laughs> And then I have a show <laughs> called, I cleverly titled it, the horror podcast where I talk about old horror movies. So, so yeah, that's, but we're here to talk about your work, especially this book, Cryptid Cinema, and you also have a new book coming out, but could you introduce yourself to the audience? Hi and, folks. Uh, uh, I'm Steve Bissett. I'm a, a born and raised Vermonter. I'm still living in Vermont. Um, and uh, I primarily uh, cut my teeth in the pop culture as a cartoonist working in the comics industry. I'm best known for the work I did back in the 1980s on uh, DC Comics Swamp Thing. Uh, I collaborated with uh, Alan Moore, John Tottleman, Rick Veach, and um, a number of other folks on Swamp Thing for about a five-year period back in the 80s. And that work is still in print to this day uh, all around the world. So, um, But my first love uh, is... My first love is dinosaurs. My first love is monsters. Um, and I have been writing about uh, that first love since the 1980s. Um, the late, great Chaz Ballin was a friend of mine. He invited me to start contributing reviews to his fanzine, Deep Red, uh, back in, God, late 80s, very early 90s. And I've been writing about horror movies, monster movies, science fiction films, fantasy films, um, and a lot of comics history ever since. I Fantastic. just retired from a 15-year stint uh, teaching at the Center for Cartoon Studies. So um, now I'm, quote, retired, unquote. <laughs> do, do you find yourself still busy? That's like <laughs> oh, more busy, more busy. I mean, now, now I'm able to work on you know projects like these and cryptid cinema, um, and uh, I don't have to table that while I do my you know primary uh, bread and butter work uh, as a I, teacher. I, I have to ask. So you've got a 700 page book about the brood. Yeah. So are you a big Cronenberg fan? Or a huge Cronenberg fan. <laughs> well, no, you know, it's it's that I love all I love all cinema and I love all comics and graphic novels and uh, the kind the, the way I look at uh, films and comics, um, you know, this book is one attempt to write about one movie that's near and dear to me. I love Cronenberg's work, uh, but The Brood was a movie that really was important to me played a, an important role in my life at a certain point, which I get into in the book. Um, the book I, I just turned into my uh, book designer, the great Tim Paxton, who designed Cryptid Cinema, the first volume, which we'll be talking about, Blake, um, is a similar deep dive into a single movie, The Legend of Boggy Creek. Uh, yeah. 1972. And um, I, I won't say that I could do a book of this magnitude about any film or about any comic but when i when i when a movie hits a nerve with me if a graphic novel really uh you know strikes me um it it, it hits on so many levels that it's hard for me to you know talk in sound bites about it yeah because the connections the pop cultural connections the, the cultural connections are spread so far and they go so deep and that depth and that vastness is what fascinates me about pop culture. And it's exactly the thing that most books ignore. I wanted to show a couple of layout pages. The um, Yeah, the, the work that Tim Paxton did. Th this is such a nifty book. I the, the layout feels very much like a 1960s or 1970s monster mag. So when I picked it up, I mean... I ordered it based on the title because as a, a, a huge fan of cryptozoology and uh, someone who's looked at this stuff my whole life, I thought, well, that sounds like a title I have to have. And and then when I got it and opened it up, I felt like I had like turned seven again. You know, like I had 
I, it, it, my parents were super uh, conservative and they wouldn't let me near the, you know, I couldn't go look at Fangoria or that kind of thing. So I would sneak off and look at Starlog and Fangoria and famous monsters and that sort of our, thing. Our so. model, uh, and Tim Paxton and I are, are roughly the same age. I, I was born in 1955. So we're of the monster kid generation. We grew up with famous monsters. We grew up with uh, the Aurora model kits. You know, I was seven when those hit the market. Castle of Frankenstein. Um, well, yeah. okay. And I was going to say Castle of Frankenstein, the, the greatest of all 1960s uh, newsstand monster magazines was our model for cryptid cinema. In there terms you go. Of design. And also uh, in terms of how it's conceptually put together, um, not so much Calvin T. Beck, who was the editor publisher, but more the writers like uh, the late Bob Stewart, and that's spelled B H O B Stewart. Yeah, and, I've seen that. And name. Joe Dante yeah. Jr. I mean, they really taught me how to think about and how to write about cinema. And that all came from Castle of Frankenstein. And uh, that's why cryptid cinema is what it is. You know, so I just, we just did an episode yesterday. We recorded about uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre because we oh. were doing, we're doing a series called Debased on a True Story. Where yeah, we're looking yeah. at the the lead, you know, whatever the facts are behind the legends, you know that sort yeah. of thing. And of course, everybody says Robert Block based Norman Bates on Ed Gein, the uh, Minnesota. He killer. also based him on Calvin T. Beck. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what I was going to say. So that's and, so and not just Calvin, but also yeah. Calvin's mother. Yes, exactly. So. That is such an amazing story. I found it through Tom Weaver's blog. And uh, read all about it. I was like, oh, so that's the astounding B-movie monster archive. So uh, I have to say, if anybody's listening to this, you haven't read that story. You need to read it. It's really interesting. So, Yeah, and Robert Block wrote about it uh, in science fiction fanzines. Uh, I've tracked down a couple of reprint editions. I may be able to reach from right here. Yes, here we go. This is Robert Block's um, The Eighth Stage of Fandom. This is a, a book that was put together in, I'd say, the mid '60s, uh, collecting some of his fanzine uh, essays for science fiction fanzines, because uh, Block was writing for science fiction fanzines going back to the '30s and '40s. Yeah. And in here is an essay about Calvin T. Beck, Calvin T. Beck's oh. mother, and Psycho oh. by Robert Block. I so, need to read go. that. That is fantastic. Okay. <laughs> I, I've just been. Fa I found this out about a month ago, two months ago, and it's just been stuck in my head. I want to know more. So. Uh, well, get your hands on, uh, and, and uh, these are not plugs that I benefit from in any way, so please don't think of it that way. Uh, I just love sharing information. Uh, uh, hmm. Dick Clemenson, Richard Clemenson, editor-publisher of Little Shop of Horror, the, one of the great fanzines uh, dedicated to Hammer Films, has been running a series of articles uh, in each new issue about some aspect of monster magazine culture. And he, he reprinted with permission Ted White, the science fiction author and editor's essay about visiting Calvin Beck's home and working on laying out an issue of Castle of Frankenstein. Wow. <laughs> so if you want to know more, Blake, you ha and that was like yeah. uh, three issues ago, four issues ago of Little Shop of Horrors. I would um, like to read that for multiple reasons. Yeah, for one thing, I, I, I'm old enough that I just, I, I got into uh, writing in print uh, right at the time when the switch was being made to digital. So um, I, I, my original work in high school, in my high school newspaper, we would like go and they would print out the sheets and we would do the wax layout, right? You know, lay it down. Yeah, on the, yep, yeah. So, yep, uh, yep. and then the by the time, waxers. exactly. And then by right, the time yep. I got to college, they had started switching to using Max. And so uh, I got, so I'm fascinated by the way that zines and magazines were done back then. Um, I think maybe the, the sort of the line between professionals and amateurs was a little bit blurry and it kind of is now in some ways. Yeah. Well, yeah, but those, those techniques that fanzine editors were using certainly by the seventies and eighties were almost identical to how professional magazines were put together, uh, local newspapers, you know, yep. the weekly, the free weeklies that, that every pocket of America has in some way, shape or form put together the same way and you can I, see it you if you go like i do a lot of newspapers.com archive research for oh, the, yeah. in, the in search of stuff all those articles in the 70s uh you know are relevant to the show 
Uh, but you can see it in the local papers, like especially around. They, they didn't put a lot of effort into the TV lineup and the movie ads. Yeah, they're so, just throwing yeah, that stuff. Yeah, down. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. You can see yeah. things are askew. You know, there's yeah. it's 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 it's. I love it. I love it. I love it. It's feel, it feels very refreshing to see how things well, used to be done. So. That's the feeling we wanted to get in cryptid cinema. Yeah, right. You did. Uh, very, you yeah. know, uh, Tim does incredibly professional layouts and designs, but Tim totally gets. You know, the, the, Tim and I are going through the stage now with, with the second Cryptid Cinema book, which is called Cryptid Cinema, The Boggy Creek Bequest. Not it, uh, Cryptid Cinema 2, Electric Bogaloo. It, that's, that's... No, no, we're not. No, uh, that, you know, that'll be the canon <laughs> films issue. So, uh, <laughs> no, the second one is called Cryptid Cinema, The Boggy Creek Bequest. That'll and, be fantastic. Um, we're at the same we're, we're still feeling out how are we going to shape the material? I've turned in all the text material, which is massive. We may have to break this into two volumes that will come out at the same time because there is a lot of material in this, in this volume. Um, but we're feeling out what it's going to be. Now, that first book, the one that you just held up that we'll be talking about primarily here, um, we knew we wanted it to look and feel like Castle Frankenstein. That was our, our conscious model. Um, what was harder for me to articulate originally to Tim was that I saw the book as sort of uh, conceptual origami. Like I wanted the book to kind of fold around the reader's mind, regardless of what order you read it in. Um, there you go. Because yeah. it's not a linear book. The first cryptid, I ended up writing the books backwards. What is going to be the third volume next year should have been the first. Um, but I, you know, I was just starting. I was just beginning to feel my way around. Okay, what is cryptid cinema? So this first book is sort of putting the boundary lines up. And some people justifiably right from the start complain that some of the stuff I wrote about aren't classic cryptozoology, right? Yes. Because my argument is cryptid cinema, like horror cinema, <laughs> like like all genres in cinema is quite diverse it's quite big and um i was i was trying to hit the furthest reaches of these are the things that that sort of define the the per, the boundaries the parameters of what i think cryptid cinema is and this second book which is focused primarily on the legend of boggy creek the 1972 charles b pierce film is just about one movie and what it spawned, what it caused, what what the legacy that followed the Legend of Boggy Creek is, because, and, and so it's a more focused book than that first volume. The first yeah. volume is like a shotgun blast, yes. in Monster Magazine goodness, yes. you know, yes, yeah, yeah, in in a good way, yeah. <laughs> and and it was also about you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, films that I like, you know, do 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 films about urban legends fit well. That's why my long write-up of this obscure Elmira, New York shot, independent movie, The Glasshead, is in the first book. What about H.P. Lovecraft? You know, I mean, is when H.P. Lovecraft referred to the Yeti for one of the first times <laughs> yeah. in popular American fiction, he wasn't referring to the, the classical Yeti that you and I think of today. He was linking it with these creatures from beyond the stars um, and and putting it in the context of these sort of crustaceans that that show up in Vermont in his story Whisper in the Darkness, um, but he's talking about the Yeti. He is referring to lore that in the late 1920s was pretty obscure. Yeah, it was not known the way it was in the 1950s, where it had entered the popular imagination. So, you know, I was testing the boundaries. A, a lot of people argued with me about including. Equinox, the 1970 film Equinox in there. But, you know, uh, I got a whole stack of paperbacks over here in my library from the 1970s of books that mash up UFO sightings and Bigfoot sightings. You know, there's yeah. this weird blurring that happened in cryptozoology in the late 60s and throughout the 70s. Yeah. Were they a cult? Were they from another dimension? Oh, that's not gone. That's you not know, gone. Yeah. Well, yeah. John, John Keel was one of the proponents exactly. of the dimension theory. And now yeah. it's like, so that first book was really about, let me have some fun 
talking about the films that are at the far edges, let me hit the grace notes. You know, I made sure Creature from the Black Lagoon, King Kong, the classic Bigfoot movies, Legend of Boggy Creek, they're all mentioned and pictured in cryptid cinema. But the focus really begins with the second volume. The first book is meant to be a fun monster magazine. You yeah, know? and, and it is. It is. I I got the book and almost immediately, just after opening up, dropped it and like ran and wrote to a bunch of my friends in the monster world. It was like, you got to get this book. Even if you don't read it, you're just going to want to look at it. It's very well. It's just it was it was captivating. So, yeah. Well, but I do want to talk about there's a lot of really cool stuff in here. Yeah, but but in the middle of all this gorgeous monster beauty, there's this wonderful essay about one of the most obscure pieces of cinema that people just don't know about. They think they do, and that is Bigfoot: America's Abominable Snowman, which oh, was yeah. which was the touring film. You could actually talk about this more than me, I think, or at least probably more uh, cogently. The this the, everybody knows the Patterson Gimlin film as being this little tiny clip of footage. But Patterson and Gimlin, when they made this movie, they actually took it on tour and they did something called four walling. And uh, this would be they rented the cinemas and then they took the ticket sales. Um, And I think from what I've heard, they made quite a bit of money, but they've got this Bigfoot America's Abominable Snowman. What was that? I mean, I, I know, but let's for, t- explain no, to the no, audience. I can you, tell you exactly what yeah, it is. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm scrolling through my. OK, yeah. here we go. Now, what, uh, in 1967, um, the uh, mysterious film footage was shot in California that is still argued about to this day by Patterson and Gimlin, and it's referred to as the Patterson-Gimlin footage. And it's a few minutes, a few seconds, really. Really, yeah. Shaky. You are there, cinema verite of a Sasquatch, female Sasquatch, looking over her shoulder and walking away. That's all that happens in this shaky footage. Um, And uh, after they had this footage, and you and I can discuss or we can ignore the controversy surrounding the footage. That's your call. It's your interview. Um, Let's let's skip it for now. (laughs) Yeah, we'll skip it for now. Let's just say say the footage existed. And then the question was, what are they going to do with it? Yes. Okay? So what ended up happening is um, there's a lot of erroneous information out there, including on Wikipedia, IMDb, uh, so on and so forth. Other than regional or national news broadcasts that showed snippets of that footage when it was relatively new. So we're talking about end of, 68, uh, end of 67, beginning of 68. The first licensed use of that footage was in a BBC Two TV special called Bigfoot, America's Abominable Snowman. And it was broadcast once in England, Saturday, July 27th, 1968. And some of my British friends have verified that for me, people like Kim Newman and Jonathan Rigby, you know, genre specialists who keep track of all these things like TV listings and yeah, so on. Yeah. So they nailed it for me. Um, it was a, We didn't know whether it had ever been shown. They nailed it. It was shown Saturday, July 27th, 1968. And it was the first nonfiction, non-newscast Sasquatch TV special anywhere in the world, as far as I know. So it was also the first licensed use of the Patterson-Gimlin film, meaning BBC Two paid something to Patterson-Gimlin and their partner. Um, And it was hosted by Dr. John Napier, who was the curator of mammals at Smithsonian Institute. And it included in its half-hour interview format a guest interview with Ivan T. Sanderson, the man who wrote the book, on the abominable snowman in the early 60s, okay? Uh, It was only shown once in the UK, never shown in America. Now, we don't know the particulars of the deal, and it's still a mystery. No paperwork has turned up. Uh, Lauren Coleman has the actual reel uh, of the film 
in the collection of the International Cryptozoology Museum in Portland, Maine. And it was Lauren Coleman who very kindly allowed me to screen oh, nice. uh, the film. Now, the print he has does not have the padding or the introduction material that Patterson added to the movie for their roadshow. One of the other museums that has a print, and that's all covered in cryptid cinema. There's a page where I actually show the, the photographs of their reels, you know, the cans of film. They may have prints that have that additional footage. I would love to see it. Me too. Now, that deal, whatever the, the contractual arrangement was with BBC Two, included Patterson getting a copy of that BBC Two documentary, okay? And perhaps more than one print of it. He either had more than one print or he had um, uh, a print that he was able to strike other prints off of. Right, right. Because uh, there, the numbers vary, but you know, he and his partner had a number of prints that they were traveling around, Probably. primarily the Northwestern states. It was Diatli, his brother-in-law, I think. It yeah, it was his, yeah. his yeah. brother-in-law, Deathly, yeah. or Diatli. I'm not sure how to yeah. pronounce it. Neither. <laughs> being from Duxbury, Vermont, don't trust my pronunciation yeah. of any <laughs> name here. Um, so what they were doing, you were right when you said they were four-walling. And four-walling was a reference to uh, a practice that goes back uh, to the silent era where a producer could come in or a distributor could come in and rent the stu the theater space. They rent all four walls. They collect the box office. The theater keeps all the concession. Okay, and um, uh, and and that practice goes back to the old states' rights system of distribution that used to be how feature films uh, were distributed throughout the U.S. and in the provinces in Canada. I think I think anybody interested in Bigfoot cinema, you're going to know Sun Classic, and they they did they were like they masters. Four and four, yeah, yeah, four yeah. walling was was a venerable practice. I mean, yeah. before Sun Classics, before uh, Patterson, um, going back to the silent era, people would travel to the Arctic. Right, they'd go to the North Pole. Oh, I've seen that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen those adventure films. They yeah, come yeah. back yeah. with film footage of that tr those, those travels, and they would rent theater spaces, auditoriums, public halls, present a lecture, show the film. And that essentially was the beginning of four walling. In fact, I just found out that practice, the early practice fairly recently, and it suddenly King Kong makes a lot more sense. Exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah. It, exactly. it gives you a whole lot more context to the world that they were kind of rolling into. So. Yeah. Yeah. Because the, the, the men who made King Kong, Marion C. Cooper and Ernest yeah. B. Schoensack, they had done that with their, their pseudo, documentaries like grass and another feature called chain um and it was hard to convince you know the studios would look at the films and go we can't sell that so four walling became a way of not just making money that you pocketed it was also a way of proving to the studios this has an audience out there yeah um, and you know even big shots like walt disney made uh, uh the first true life adventure nature film which was i believe beaver valley steve asked me to insert this quick correction seal island in 1948 was the first of the true life adventures from disney and this was the one that disney had to four wall to sell to rko on, or at least to prove the concept beaver valley was 1958 and that was the second of these kind of features and by this time rko was on board and back to the show and RKO, the, the distributor of King Kong, was distributing Disney's films, and he showed them his true life adventure, and they went, no. Nah. We... So what Disney did is he rented four walls, a theater space, and uh, it did so well that RKO changed their mind and went, oh. And, you know, the way it changes their mind is they go, oh, there's money to be made. Exactly, here. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Patterson was doing that. Patterson and his brother-in-law were doing that with their slightly padded version of Bigfoot, America's an Abominable Snowman. Now, it was a half-hour program. The BBC Two uh, production is half an hour long, 30 minutes. So they were padding it out to what? 
45 minutes, an hour. I'm not sure until I see it. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I see there was a talk. I, I've seen pictures. Yeah, they of had standing. a talk. Yeah, yeah. They gave a lecture. I mean, they went right back to the prototype from the early 1900s of, you know, <laughs> Explorer goes to Africa, shoots footage in Africa, comes back. No studio wants it. He roadshows it. That's yeah. exactly what Patterson was doing. With now, yeah. Gimlin was out at this point, right? He, they'd had some kind of falling out. Yeah. Or Gimlin wasn't interested. I mean, it's a lot of work. You know, yeah. you you like you you gotta schlep this stuff around the country. You've got to put it. You know, typically you got to run ads, ads, a lot of advertising. You got to do the yeah. advertising yeah. beforehand. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is a variation of how exploitation cinema classically worked. You know, uh, guys like Kroger, Bab, <laughs> with one of the biggest money makers in American cinema history, was a movie called Mom and Dad. It was like a sex film that ended with a uh, an actual childbirth on camera. You know, which was the only way most most Americans saw a woman's breasts and vagina for the first time on a screen. And they were schlepping the prints of mom and dad around in their car, in the trunk of their car. They'd show up at the theater, show segregated shows, men only, women only. And then they were out of town before the police could show up. Right. Um, so that's what Patterson was doing. You know, Patterson and his brother-in-law were they would target a community. uh figure out where they're going to show it. And it might not be in a movie theater. It might be at the high school auditorium. It might be at the local town hall. And they would show the film, do their talk. Uh, and Patterson also printed up his book, his famous book, uh, one of the first books on uh, Bigfoot published in America. And he would sell those. And then they'd go on to the next town. They made a lot of money you know, and it and and when you're pocketing that money, it's cash that you're picking up at the right. box office. It feels like a lot of money, but six months in, that gets pretty old. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's 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 not that different from being a band and you're touring, right? Or it's yeah, not yeah. that different from being a live theater troupe and you're touring. Um, yeah, you don't have to do the full performance every night, but it's still a horse and pony show that you're trotting out, or in this case, a Sasquatch and pony show you're trotting out. Um, that played through 1969, perhaps early 1970. Part of the plan was the roadshow was initially going to be, let's prove this works, but then let's you know strike a deal with one of these nature film distributors, and then they can take it over. Well, that plan went south when they actually started getting the money from the box office. And it's like, well, we don't want to share this. Um, once it had run its course and Patterson also, I believe was ill with some form of cancer. I mean, right. His health was suffering um, for whatever reason. Once it ran its course, um, they had proven there was an audience for these films, but other uh, forces had come to play. And the studio they had talked to was one of a number of outfits that were road showing these hunting and these wilderness nature uh, documentaries. And those movies were making big bucks at the end of the 60s. Movies like Vanishing Wilderness, you know, um, they were making big money. And um, and they ended up buying, they, they did license the, the footage from uh, Patterson and his, uh, and perhaps his brother-in-law was still a partner at that point. I'm not sure as yet. Um, but they ended up just running it as like a 15 minute short that was called Bigfoot before uh, a film they had picked up from the National Film Board of Canada on wolves, actually a very excellent film called Cry of the Wild um, about wolves. And that's where uh, the Patterson Gimlin film was first played theatrically in the United States was as uh, the short before uh, Cry of the Wild. Wow. So I guess that's, that's that's fantastic. And, and, and I don't think people understand, or, or, I mean, it it seems like almost a forgotten film. And I think there's what, five copies left. Yeah. And here's the problem. And it is a problem, right? If BBC two, the current incarnation of BBC knew that those prints existed, they'd be saying, we want that back. Right. Nobody knows what the deal was with Patterson. Patterson's dead. And there's a lot of legal quagmire around that. And I've been told by a number of, I, I've been uh, doing uh, bonus feature work for a number of Blu-ray labels over the past year. 
And it's a lot of fun. And I bet. I really enjoy it. I but do that for right, free with my kids, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Well, but, but the Dad, right shut up. We're watching the movie. But, the <laughs> rights issues associated with that kind of thing can be really sticky. Yeah, and I think that's why it has become a lost film. We know there's some prints out there, uh, and a, and I can say that at least one of the institutions that has a print put feelers out and then pulled them right back because it's like they're not in the the business of distributing film. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. that can get very expensive very quickly. Well, um, they have they have a deep catalog of stuff that I would be happy to pay for. They don't stream or make available anywhere. So, I, well, that's they, it. The question yeah. is, I mean, BBC. You know, as we all, if you're a Doctor Who fan, you know, BBC like destroyed a lot of their legacy. You know, yes, there are yes. lost episodes. Oh, appropriate to the subject we're discussing, the first of the abominable snowman Doctor Who. Uh, uh story arcs is gone that's among yeah. the missing episodes from doctor who i do have the novelization <laughs> yeah the novelization is out there that's what i read as well to, yeah, to get yeah. my handles on it but uh, you know so uh, this stuff is it, it's real legal quicksand um, yeah i keep hoping uh that something might change in that regard but having um having been able to Listen to Pamela Pierce Barcelou, who inherited um, and um, saw to resurrecting and restoring her father's film, The Legend of Boggy Creek. It that process cost her tens and tens and tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah, and none of these museums are in a position. They don't have an endowment that allows them to go, right, here's the $100,000 we'll set aside to try to bring the long lost half hour or one hour or 45 minute Bigfoot America's Abominable Snowman to market, much as you and I would can love that. I would, I would pay. I'd <laughs> yeah, be happy to. Exactly. I'd love to have a copy. Now, I did see someone seems to have segments of it on YouTube, or that's what it certainly looks like it. Well, when I was able to uh, watch the film, um, and I was I was permitted to watch it quite closely uh, and spend time with it, I have prepared a full transcript of the BBC Two production that will be published in the the third Cryptid Cinema volume. It'll be part. It'll be the a part of the chapter on the films of the '60s. So I will be providing as close as I can as a writer. Yeah, you know the experience to interested readers like yourself like so but I have, and okay, it is so, a full tra transcription from am, beginning to end of am, everything this is a been huge there. public service i appreciate it and i will happily i would bought the next copy anyway yeah and it is a fact i mean it is a classic piece of cryptozoological pop culture i mean it's yeah. a really important piece of work and thank god it has been preserved in a number of museums um and uh for their own purposes, some of those museums have transferred it to DVDR, but they cannot loan it out. They cannot sell it. You know, they cannot lease it. So they're at least trying to see to preserving the content for the ages. Yeah. But, you know, the museums just aren't set up for this kind of thing. If there's any underfunded branch of museums in North America, it's cryptozoological yeah, yeah, museums. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Clearly, what Charles B. Pierce started with The Legend of Boggy Creek has taken over and permeated our pop culture in ways yes. that were unimaginable in 1970. Well, I mean, it, he's certainly got some room in my head that won't be uh, least to anyone else. I got, <laughs> you know, in the <laughs> second book, I really try to get into how it's hard to communicate to someone in the year 2021 how pioneering that film was in yes. 1972. Have you, so you've seen the the, the new restoration. I the, the new restoration is yeah. is glorious. I yeah. mean, it, and it's not just the fact that you know Pamela Pierce and the Eastman uh, House uh, did a proper job of curating, uh, working with Technicolor and Technoscope, and lavishing the same attention on the audio track as well. Uh, the Jaime Mendoza Nava um, soundtrack, not just the music, but the whole oral. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's phenomenal. It's, it, that's fantastic. But that is. what's hard to describe is it's one of those things like, you know, there was cinema before King Kong and there was cinema after King Kong. Right. And right. we cannot imagine what it was like. We, we just, it is not 
impossible for us to even imagine what it was like in 1933 to experience that for the first time. I got to hear uh, Ray Harryhausen and Ray Bradbury talk about how seeing that film changed their life. Yeah, right? yeah. And, 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 and it, you know, talking about other genres, I mean, you know, there there were Westerns before John Ford's stage yes. <laughs> and there were Westerns <laughs> after John Ford's stagecoach. But there's no way to put yourself back in what it was like in 1939 to experience stagecoach. And in my lifetime, well, how old are you, Blake? I am 51. Okay, I'm 66. In my lifetime, I experienced Night of the Living Dead. Nice. And there was cinema before yes. Night of the Living Dead, and there was cinema after Night of the Living Dead. Yeah, and yeah. I, I want to put it to your listeners, the people viewing, the people with us in this you know, uh, venue. The Legend of Boggy Creek was almost that landscape altering a film in a very modest way. And part of what I love about late sixties, early seventies, independent film is there was a lot of that shit happening, right? Um, no studio saw easy rider coming Columbia lucked into picking it up and benefited from the millions and millions of dollars it generated in, in theaters. But there's no way a motion picture studio like MGM 20th century Fox or Columbia Pictures, would have made Easy Rider. The same goes for Night of the Living Dead, Legend of Boggy Creek, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Eraserhead later in the 70s. You know, the, the films that altered the cinema landscape, the films that changed everything about our, how our, even our imaginations functioned as individuals yeah. came out of nowhere. They came out of the woodwork. And one of those was that little movie shot in Texarkana with a with a rented technoscope camera by a guy who had hosted a kiddie show and ran an advertising uh, firm who had the wherewithal to go, I'm going to make this movie. And it was a crazy movie that he made because it was yeah. sort of like a Disney nature documentary, right? Yep, yep. It was sort of like the wilderness adventure uh independent films that were everywhere at that time. And it was sort of a monster movie, but it wasn't any of those things. <laughs> yeah. It's... He put together things that shouldn't have worked together. You know, like why have two songs in a monster movie? Like why do that? Well, yeah. when you think about it, our gen my generation and you probably got a taste of it growing up. We grew up with all these, you know, Disney true life adventures narrated by Rex Allen and Tex Ritter. And there'd be a song. And so Charles Pierce went, okay, I'm going to have a couple of songs, right? Cause this is like folksy, right? This is about the people. And that's the other thing that made it work is really that movie is about a place and a time and a, and the people who live there. The monster is sort of the, the, you know, the planet with the gravitational pull for the whole thing. But what made that movie sing, I saw it when it opened at the Paramount Theater in Barrie, Vermont, up here in New England. And when we saw that movie, even though they were speaking with accents that were not our Vermont accents, we recognized those people. We yeah. recognized those lifestyles. We were poor. <laughs> yeah. You know, we didn't have a pot to piss in. And what was amazing about that film is it was one, it was, if not the first, it was one of the first films to go, you don't have to go to Skull Island to find a weird critter. Yeah. It's out by your laundry right now. It might reach right in your window. Yeah. It might grab you <laughs> while you're taking a dump. Yeah, <laughs> you know? Like... And that was a revelatory experience back then. It really was. Yeah. And I'll never forget how loud the audience was screaming by that last sequence, you know, uh, with the assault on, on the house. I mean, it really worked. It really worked. No, it did. End, it's a it good, it's a scare fun. that haunted me for decades. Yeah. Yeah. That. Yeah. But it wasn't the scare. You know what the scare did? The scare is what had people go home and talk about the movie. Yeah. And it was word of mouth that like all these films I'm mentioning, it was word of mouth that propelled it. Um, it was distributed by this outfit, Howco International, that if you look at uh, go ahead and look online at other films from the 50s and 60s that Howco International distributed. I'll give you some titles. The Brain from Planet Arouse, Teenage Monster, 
<laughs> Night of Bloody Horror. Now you look at their ads and it's like classic old science fiction monster movie ads, you know, see, see, you know, <laughs> lurid ads. The ad that Charles Pierce and Jim Ball, uh, who was his partner in the advertising firm, and the artist they hired, Ralph McQuarrie, who did the painting, that they put together was the antithesis of how Halco International had sold every other movie they'd ever released. It was the image, the title, and three words, a true story, and the credits. That was the promotion for Legend of Boggy Creek. Um, they had a great radio spot, <laughs> and, and they did sell it with TV spots once the film was out there and began to rack up earnings at the box office. Yeah, but yeah. It, was, it, was, it was sold in a way that no other monster movie had certainly ever been sold. And it was sold in a way that no nature documentary had ever been sold. It was something new. We had never even seen a true crime movie sold that way. I, speaking of influential, I, I noticed I've been watching a lot of um, uh, a lot of Bigfoot movies. Oh, to yeah. Do, to yeah, do a bonus too. feature for. for Well, it all started. Uh, I was going to go to a convention and do a talk. I was on a panel that was going to be about Bigfoot movies. And I thought, well, I'll go watch all four, you know, oh, and no, I was like, yeah, of them now. <laughs> there's over 200 listed yeah, yeah. on IMDb and, yeah. and counting. They're still, they're still coming out. Oh yeah. Yeah. But watch, I've been back. I, I went, I went old and I, after Boggy Creek, so many of the Bigfoot movies have a, either a documentary or pseudo documentary sort of style. And they all have a song. And often terribly catchy. Not not a crab tree catchy, but catchy. So right, right, so, right. So that 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 pattern. I, I'd I'd love to just put together a playlist on Spotify, but a lot of these aren't available of just just Bigfoot songs from Bigfoot cinema. So. My my son Danny, who is a musician, uh, among many other things, um, has been working on just that kind of project. And um, uh, for the third Cryptid Cinema book, uh, we're going to put together sort of an overview of what LPs and 45s are released, you know. Oh, yeah. There like, a number uh, of them, you know. There's, uh, Sasquatch, The Legend of Bigfoot. Uh, they four-walled that one. It came yeah. to my hometown. I didn't buy it, but they were selling an album that had all the tracks on it. Like, like Don't a, you a, wish a, you'd yeah. bought it. Don't well, wish, yeah, but I was, you know? <laughs> I, I was poor. I, <laughs> hey, not, you know, what could you do? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of that stuff out there. And that all started with Legend of Boggy Creek, you know. Uh, it all started there. Um, there were... There was one Bigfoot movie, you know, we've talked about Bigfoot, America's Abominable Snowman. It was the first documentary right. that made its way from BBC Two over to America and was roadshowed in 1969, early 70. 1970 was the first uh, narrative fiction film that sold itself as a Bigfoot movie because the title was Bigfoot. <laughs> um, depending on your taste, I mean... Let, let's get down and dirty. Uh, given the context of this panel, we're supposed to be talking about bad taste films, correct? That, I think that's right there in the brain. Well, right? Bigfoot <laughs> 1970 fits right in there. Now that's, right? that's, if I remember correctly, that's Bigfoot, it mates with anything. Is that the tagline? Well, that's one of the taglines. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, this it is was, um, Robert Mitchum's son. Is that, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, okay. the, Mitchum's brother is in it, right? Yeah. With John Carradine. Yes, and, yes, yes, yes. He's playing the, I, uh, the the greasy sales guy, the assistant to John Carradine's traveling salesman. Joy Lansing. I mean, yeah. has an amazing exploitation cast. She's it's, very talented. She I, <laughs> she was. <laughs> She's, and, and it is a film about miscegenation. The whole premise of that 1970 Bigfoot movie is they're mating with human women. In fact, there's a little Bigfoot. Yes, there is. Loathed by the other Bigfoots because it's part human part Bigfoot, right? Yeah. Now, this whole miscegenation theme goes way back. Right? Yeah, well, I'm from Georgia. Reading. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've been reading a lot of <laughs> early uh, science fiction hominid stories, be going back to the 18, late 1800s, early 1900s. And the whole miscegenation theme of, you know, hairy jungle beasts that aren't gorillas, you know, wanting to mate with humans or having mated with humans, that was popping up in short stories back uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. Yeah. Um, and it was already sort of in the DNA. And if you're just talking about Bigfoot movies, um, take a look at the 1950s 
Yeti movies. Uh, one of the first American um, abominable snowman movies came out in 1956. It was uh, made by Jerry Warren, an, an infamous low-budget filmmaker who had made some of the most stupefying movies ever made. It's his best movie. And it's called Man Beast. And the whole premise of Man Beast is there's an expedition going up into the Himalayas trying to find a lost expedition, a brother who has disappeared. And the guide who is leading him into the Himalayas, it turns out, is part Yeti, part human. And oh. he's leading them up there so that he can dispose of the men on the expedition and save and breed with the woman, the sole woman who's part of the expedition. That's 1956. Okay. Wow. Um, so by the time we get to 1970 with the, big, the movie called Bigfoot, it's it's in the genetic, you know, it's in the genetic code of these cryptid movies. And part of why I talk about cryptid cinema as a genre is, isn't that part of the impetus of King Kong? Isn't that what drives the creature from the Black Lagoon, right? This whole threat of an allure of interspecies. Well, that's, uh, you, you included uh, the uh, Dunwich Horror? Oh yeah, because and then, Lovecraft uh, uh, was right Love, on Lovecraft's board. Lovecraft's right up yeah. in all that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. I mean, right out there, you know. Yeah. So. Um, and what what is the Dunwich Horror? It's two brothers who are the result of miscegenation yeah, yeah, between yeah. some being from the other side and a mortal woman, and one of them is more like a human being, Wilbur, and the other yeah. one that we don't see until the end of the story. Uh, looks more like its father is the yeah. famous tagline of the story, you know? Um, yeah, that's a lot of what drives cryptid cinema. Also, I would argue, you know, that is the unsavory aspect of the genre because it really also has to do with racist and xenophobic attitudes that still permeate this culture to this day. Yeah. Not the way they used to. I mean, you know, you never, ever uh, would have... Um, uh, you just wouldn't have seen a film as explicit as, say, Night of the Demon, which was made in 1980. That's a Bigfoot movie you have to see. Oh, I've seen it. Like, yeah, yeah. Okay. We've covered. I've covered it for my bonus material. That is a. Uh, it is a, a seriously crazy film. It uh, is a seriously crazy. Well, film. I've argued though. I mean, it, it it probably the most Lovecraftian Bigfoot movie ever made, as near as yeah. I can tell. So I mean, I agree. It, it, Until you get to Demon Warp. Yeah, I haven't got the Demon Warp oh, yet. Oh yeah, Demon Warp it, takes it, it, it to it another level. List. So. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, Night of the Demon is very much a Lovecraftian spin on the Northern California Sasquatch lore. Uh, yeah, the ways yeah. about it. It, I, 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 I liked it. I mean, I, I it's like I, it's people a great war, movie. I, people I warned me, did, you won't like this movie. It's a piece of trash. I'm like, I like a lot of trash. It was pretty good. <laughs> it was an amazing. I mean, that was one of those movies I first saw on VHS while binging with friends, where you'd go to yeah. the video store, rent like five movies you'd never heard of. Yeah, and that was one of the ones that like we our jaws were dropping, and we were yeah, like, no, I, I, we can't believe we're. I managed it. to get my wife to watch it with me, which. uh she 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 just kept hearing me say, "Oh my God, I can't believe this is that." It's like, "Are you kidding me?" And she's like, "Just rewind it. I'll watch it with you." So she sat down and we watched the whole thing. It's like it was great. So I think person. I think that and Samurai Cop are like the two most recent. I, again, let's, let's call them trash cinema, but very engaging cinema. So yeah. you know, out of out of all those nineteen seventies uh, Bigfoot movies that followed, most of them made the same mistake that all the films before Legend of Boggy Creek made, which is the beauty of Legend of Boggy Creek was you don't have to go anywhere. These things are going to show up in your backyard. Yeah. Almost every Bigfoot movie that followed two to three years after Legend of Boggy Creek made the mistake of embracing the old, let's go on an expedition, right? And the big difference is extraordinary people get horses and donkeys and go camping out in the wilderness looking for creatures the beauty of legend of boggy creek is ordinary people had that yeah. happen to them right and as yeah. soon as you make the decision i'm gonna go in the woods and just camp for three months in hopes of seeing bigfoot 
you are no longer an ordinary person. <laughs> that's true. No, that's a, that's a really interesting point. I like that. And so. they turned them into expedition films all over again, yeah. which is what Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's The Lost World was in 1912, and when they filmed it in 1925, and that's what King Kong was in 1933, and that's what The Creature from the Black Lagoon was in 1953, blah, blah, blah. And the big difference was Legend of Boggy Creek disposed of all that they got rid of all those creaky old narrative templates but genre works in such a way that when a when a movie punches a hole in a genre and creates something new blazes a new path a new way of telling a story most people who follow consciously or unconsciously go back to the old template and that's part of why those mid-70s bigfoot movies really aren't much fun you know it's they're mainly they're sort of like bad westerns that yeah. only have a minute, if that, of a monster at the end, right? Yeah. And it's not until my favorite of the ones that followed is the uh, creature from Black Lake. Oh, that is a good one. Yeah. And it's yeah. a really good one. It, you know, the premise is two college students are going to go down south and go where there's been sightings of monsters. And that, okay, they're not on an expedition. You know, college students do that kind of stuff and always have. And so it sort of, had its cake and ate it too and it's actually a really entertaining little oh it, it's budget. it's solid it's no, a it's solid, solid film right yeah, great yeah, performances yeah. so uh, many character actors oh my gosh oh yeah. yeah yeah jackie yeah. lamb yeah yeah you know? <laughs> it's like you've got like half of sam peckinpah's you yeah. know entourage there in in creature from black lake black lake um so that's the one i would recommend i would recommend creature from black lake and night of the demon to anybody who's curious about you know what followed Legend of Boggy Creek that that stood out? Because most of the others don't. I mean, there's ones like Cry Wilderness, which is a really awful movie, but it's entertaining as an awful movie. That's one with the little boy who sees Bigfoot and sort of bonds with it. And, you know, but it's it's not, it, it's it's entertaining for all the wrong reasons, as opposed to Creature from Black Lake and Night of the Demon, which are entertaining for all the right reasons. <laughs> yeah, very much so. <laughs> well, I, I, I hope to get to all those. I, I don't know how I'll, I'll manage, but I, I'm creeping through my 200. So we'll, well get let me let me give you some recommendations, may I? Yeah, absolutely. That'd be great. And, okay, here's sort of my, you know, my favorites of, of the genre. Um, uh, as I mentioned at the end of uh, Cryptid Cinema, you know, my my favorite cryptid film when I was finishing that book was Guillermo del Toro's The Shape of Water. That's a, that's a good one, yeah. And it's the only one, other than Legend of Boggy Creek, that my wife has ever watched, and that she enjoyed. <laughs> <laughs> so, I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it's and a it's, beautiful film. I mean, it's a it's, it's movie. far more beautiful than I think Lovecraft would have ever expected anything like that oh, to God, be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and but what was interesting to me, and this always happens, is when it was embraced by the world at large, a lot of my most diehard genre friends despised it like they all found things wrong with it and to me it's just like what's a fairy kind of, tale i mean you know well, yeah. it, it's a great cryptid movie it is yeah. the best creature from the black lagoon since the creature from the, black, the black lagoon, lagoon period <laughs> but in it's, terms it's, of it's no humanoids from the deep <laughs> no but my, marge my wife marge is not going to sit through humanoids from the no, deep no 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 ever. no ever <laughs> Uh, okay, so here's the ones I'd recommend to you. Um, out of the current batch, the brand, the more recent movies of like the last 10 years, um, I pulled four that I'm going to recommend to you. Okay. Abominable, which if you have not seen, uh, it's a great little suspense horror film that hinges on a Sasquatch. It's basically Hitchcock's rear window with Sasquatch. Wow. Um, exists which is my favorite of the found footage uh, Bigfoot movies. And there's a ton of those out there. And I have watched at least 25 of them. And the one that's entitled Exists is the best of the bunch. Um, it, it actually works quite beautifully. Uh, Primal Rage. And let me give you the subtitle as well, because there's a lot of movies called Primal Rage. It's called Primal Rage Bigfoot Reborn. Uh, it's a film by Patrick McGee. The first hour is brilliant i think i think it's a brilliant exploitation monster movie the first hour works like a charm and then it goes off the rails it gets really stupid but it doesn't ruin the power of that first hour which i've gone back to a couple of times 
And I also recommend if you have the time, and it is an investment of time, the best mini series that's been done that fits cryptid cinema is the AMC series, The Terror. Uh, the first season uh, where it's a self-contained story. It is that's a, a based on Simmons' novel, right? I think. Yeah, yeah and yeah. it is a great adaptation of, of uh, the Dan Simmons novel. And it is, on its own terms, one of the real classics of uh, cryptid cinema. It is a brilliant piece of work. Nice. Um, so those four I recommend. Um, I can also recommend, uh, if you're into... Now, the Wendigo is one of those beings that some people don't consider a cryptid because you know it's tied to native american and first nation lore uh although you know there's entire academic textbooks out there about when to go lore and so on so yeah. i'm not sure where it goes but it's unusual that we have a single filmmaker larry fessenden who has done not one not two but three variations on the wendigo and they are all three completely different from one another and i recommend watching all three in the order that larry made them because okay. they're brilliant um there's his feature called wendigo which i actually got to see in a theater it was it was when there were still independent <laughs> art theaters in pockets of new england and i got to see wendigo uh in a theater and um the second one is his feature the last winter starring ron perlman um, it's an ecological science fiction thriller, but it is also about Wendigo lore and where it comes from and what it is. And the last one is he did an episode of the TV series Fear Itself. And there's an episode uh, involving uh, Wendigo, uh, a white man who disappears in the wilderness. And when he comes back, he is transformed. This is classic Wendigo case history stuff. So I recommend those three, um, either back to back or experience somehow together. Nice. Then there's, yeah. then there's the art house, you know, then there's the, the cryptid cinema examples that, that don't fit at all the kind of exploitation or bad taste of, that we're, we're primarily talking about here. But I got to recommend them to people because, you know, cryptid cinema has been around long enough that it has now expanded as genres do beyond the parameters of just the little niche that it began in. Um, I recommend the last broadcast from 1998. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. um, and um, it fascinates me as a film because yes, it's about the Jersey devil, but it's not about the Jersey devil. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> and, exactly. And that's sort of the shell game of the movie. Um I also really influential on the Blair Witch people. I mean, clearly. well, yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, not only that, I mean, the last broadcast in 1998 is truly the first American feature that was made all digital and projected all digital in a digital theater. It's the first film that did that a year before George Lucas claimed to have done it with the Phantom Menace. Wow. A year before the Blair Witchcraft, uh, Blair Witch Project came out. Right. So. Last Broadcast is this incredible pioneer movie. Uh, to me, it's the jazz singer of the digital age. The jazz singer is the film that famously, you know, opened up movies to sound. Sure. And uh, to me, The Last Broadcast is that for how we all watch movies today. You know, we go to a theater, and a lot of people don't go to theaters anymore, <laughs> pandemic aside. Yeah. But if you go to a theater... You are watching your films projected digitally. The yep. last broadcast was the ground zero of that technology. In fact, the night they first showed it, they were working with Texas Instruments, and no one knew if it was going to work. Wow. They were pretty sure it was going to work. They had tested it, and in principle, it should work, but they did not know, is this going to work? Can we download it from a satellite and digitally project it? And yep. it worked. So. Okay, and um, I'm also going to mention um, The Shape of Water, which I think fits in this, you know. The Shape of Water is sort of the cryptid movie for people who don't like cryptid movies. Yeah, yeah. Just like I, I, I seriously, it's a monster movie for people who don't like monster movies. It, it's just an amazing movie. I um, highly, I concur 100%. Yeah. Okay, the other cryptid films I'd recommend that kind of fit that, uh, The Beast of the Southern Wild. Have you seen that film? I haven't. Uh, that's um, 
Is that the one with the girl and like there's a flood? Yeah, yeah. It's okay, all set so. down in uh, the ba- the southern basin, uh, a village that has been essentially wiped out by one of the hurricanes. And it's this little girl who is trying to, you know, make sense of the adult world that she li- has grown up in, who have basically, they have lost everything to the hurricanes that sweep through states like Louisiana and Mississippi and so on. And she keeps having this vision in her head of these huge prehistoric bison-like creatures that are coming toward them. And it's like cryptozoology as the embodiment of nature. And it's showing what that is in a child's imagination and what it is in the adult world, you know, and that she's not wrong that that's what she sees coming in because that is how these forces of climate change are operating in the real world. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a brilliant movie. It's I've a seen, beautiful like, all movie. The, yeah. It's going to say it's, I, the beauty of the cinematography. Oh, it is, yeah, it's yeah. a ravishing film. And it's also just a wonderful feat of characterization and storytelling. It, it, it is truly extraordinary. One of the best independent American films of the last decade, but it is a cryptid movie. And it is a brilliant cryptid movie. Um, There's a movie that got some, you know, buzz when it was first announced, but it is a great film. Uh, Sam Elliott in The Man Who Killed Hitler and then Bigfoot. (laughs) I love that movie. I love It sounds like a gimmick, but it is a terrific movie. And it's a terrific movie that's very relevant to everything we're dealing with in America right now. Yeah. Because it, 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 yes, Bigfoot's in it. And yes, it does involve, I mean, it doesn't lie. It, it doesn't lie. Yeah. Yeah. Kill also, Hitler and it, then it, the Bigfoot. It's a, it's also, it seems like it's a meditation on aging and on, on, love. on the reality of narrative versus yep. perceived uh, sort of, uh, uh, I guess, what like your personal narrative versus the sort of legends that can form around you, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. and why I think it's an important film, because we're seeing this play out in really scary ways right now. It's also about how it doesn't matter if something that people believe in is real or not. It also doesn't matter if you kill the human embodiment of an evil, right? He assassinates Hitler, but it doesn't stop. It doesn't change anything. Fascism, it doesn't change anything. And we're having to confront that day in, day out, right now in our own culture, right? Yeah. No, it, it's and I won't go into movie. it because we're, yeah. we're not here to do a political, you know, no, no, panel. No. <laughs> but, but that's part of the power of the man who killed Hitler and then the Bigfoot. And it is a brilliantly done uh, film. It, it's really moving. It's really beautiful. And Sam Elliott gives just a magnificent. He does. He does. He's so. he's man. I, I, I think uh, I think maybe his first big role was. Um, well, the he goes uh, Lego, back to frogs, my friend. Well, he did, he was in frogs, and there was another movie he was in where he didn't talk, but he was in a legacy was like the first big movie I remember. Well, to me, big, yeah, uh, yeah, the, yeah. The, no, he goes back to the, the legacy. I remember, yeah, so I, think, I, I remember Sam, he made some great westerns too in the 80s yeah. and 90s. Oh, well, so. he's in um, uh, Butch Casting the Sundance Kid in an unspeaking part, yeah. that's right, and they, and he's because uh. What uh Ross, um, his wife, uh they they to get Catherine Ross, they're in yeah. that movie together and then they don't get married or anything. Right. And then later they do legacy together and they do get married. Like so and they they're still together. And they Sam God. Elliott was one of those character actors initially, sort of like you know, a more romantic slab of Harry Dean Stanton. You know, <laughs> yeah, you look yeah. back at early Harry Dean Stanton roles in the 60s, and it's like, man, nobody would have dreamed where what he was going to become for us as an actor. And exactly. Sam yeah. Elliott is, you know, in a unique path, similar to that, uh, went a different way in a different, but this, this film is, uh, I can't recommend it highly enough. Yeah. It's, it's a goodie. I have, I totally agree. Totally agree. Uh, there's a really strange one that a lot of people haven't heard of called letters from the big man. Have you heard of that? Or something? I have heard of it. I haven't, I haven't seen it, but I have definitely heard it. of it. You yeah. gotta see it, right? I remember when it was when it was being produced. Like uh, I, the the cryptic community was talking all about it. It's so, well yeah. worth seeing, yeah. and it is a terrific little movie. And it also expands uh, a whole branch of cryptid cinema, some of which we've already been talking about. You know, the whole interspecies 
aspect of it, but it takes it in a whole different direction. And it, it is a wonderful uh, film, really terrific movie. Cool. Highly, highly recommend That's it. That's maybe the only one you've talked about. I don't have in my collection. Uh, so I, I should track it. Better go get it. it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, there's also uh, uh, a film um, from uh, the Asian realm. I want to mention three Asian films. Uncle Boon Mi, who can recall his past lives. I've heard of that. I don't that know why. Is a, yeah. yeah, it's a strange, very lovely ghost story, essentially. But there is a strong cryptid element in it that uh, plays a really key role. And um, and I, I highly recommend it. it it's, it's, uh, it's a really haunting, playful, somber film. And all those three things actually percolate together in the movie. So um, nice. Uncle Boon Me, who can recall his past lives. I'll put a, I'll put uh, links to all this in the show notes. Right. So yeah. And uh, the other two I'm going to recommend, people have probably seen and didn't think of them as cryptid films. Um, and uh, they're they're both films uh, that got a lot of play here in the states because Bong Joon Ho made them. Uh, the first one is The Host, which is one of my all-time favorite Kaiju films. Mm -hmm. Um. Arguably not a cryptid, and, and I get into this uh, in the filmography. There's two filmographies in the back of the second cryptid cinema book. One called uh, the Cryptid Cinema Filmography, where I'm proposing a filmography. But with it is the Cryptid Companion Filmography. And this includes films where, if you've seen the host, it starts like a cryptid movie. There's some sort of bizarre life form that leaps out of the water and is seizing mm -hmm. people. Um, we never quite find out like what made it. It's tied in with some American pharmaceutical firm having a sloppy lab practice that probably spawned it. So it's sort of a mutant movie, which would mean it's not a cryptid, you know, in, in the way that in the in cryptozoology we think about unidentified life forms. But it's a I think it's one of the brilliant Kaiju films of all time. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, and 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 has a lot of interesting family dynamics and humor. Oh yeah, god, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. There's some, there's just some laugh out loud stuff in it, and also some really powerful, wrenchingly sad uh, moments in the film too. And uh, uh, Bong Joon Ho also made a brilliant movie that I believe is only available on Netflix to watch, which is Okja. O-K-J-A. Oh, The Giant Pig. That is a great cryptid yeah. movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and again, yeah. it doesn't quite fit cryptid. When the film starts, it's like classical, you know, cryptid, especially since, I would say since Gorgo, you know, in 1960, 61, this whole bond between children and unidentified creatures that live out there has gone from being kind of a monster movie trope to codified in like the Gamera movies <laughs> and the yeah, later Godzilla yeah, movies yeah, yeah. in the in the early 70s. Um, and Okja takes it to a whole new level. And it's also just a brilliant slice of satire. And uh, uh, it, it's a great movie. There's yeah. one moment in it where I could not stop laughing, which is there is a uh, one of those city disaster scenes that are so beloved of Kaiju films. And suddenly a John Denver song begins to play on the, <laughs> on the soundtrack. And it is sublime. It is the perfect, perfect way of um, taking that movie to its next level. So um, uh, that, those are two odd ones that I would really recommend to anyone who loves cryptid cinema. Fantastic. These are great recommendations. I'm very excited about this. I, thank you so much for spending so much time talking to me. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Hopefully so, we'll do this again. Yeah, uh, no, for sure. So when the book comes out, uh, when, when do you think the next one's coming out? Well, uh, I will keep you posted. And in fact, if you're interested, Blake, I will send you progress on it. Uh, I'll make you one of the folks that we send PDFs Oh, I'm to definitely so interested. And in so I'm sure see it coming yeah, together. Yeah. And, um, the way I, I mean, we're doing it print on demand with Amazon the same way we did the first book. And part of the beauty of that system is you can tweak it. Like we're, yeah. we're actually able to print copies, make corrections, make changes. So and this is actually printed by that, Amazon. That's really? print on demand. And this is that, fantastic quality. Oh yeah. And that book primarily existed and came together the way it did because I was testing the system. If you look through it, uh, I have 
spiced it with a lot of my original artwork. Yeah. And I chose artwork that was done with different tools. So there's grayscale painted artwork, there's wash drawings, there's brush and ink, pen and ink, because I wanted to see how would it look with the current print on demand technology. And it came out looking great. So with um, the Boggy Creek Bequest, we're doing it in color. We're gonna push the, the envelope in terms of color. We will also make it available in black and white because color books are very expensive. I was actually going to ask you, so what, is that, what does that do to the per unit yeah, cost? Yeah, I don't know. So the color edition could be crazy expensive. So yeah. I, what, we, what we hope to do is a color hardcover edition for the real connoisseurs, a color paperback edition, and then uh, a black and white edition. Or we may break it into two black and white editions so the people that just want to read about Legend of Boggy Creek can get the one book in black and white, very affordably priced, around 21 bucks. Yeah. And volume two would be the second half of Boggy Creek Bequest focuses on um, some of the films that came after. I, I do a full interview with Sean Whiteley, the man who directed uh, Southern Fried Bigfoot, which is my, my favorite of all the documentaries that followed um, what Charles Pierce did. And I watched, I watched hundreds of them. I'm not exaggerating. Yeah, well, I know and, they exist. I, yeah, so. And I did a full career length film by film interview with Seth Breedlove covering the entire small town monsters filmography. Yeah. Um, nice. Because to me, what Sean did with Southern fried Bigfoot and what Seth and Mark and all the people that are part of the small town monsters team have done is they've taken uh, the trail that Charles Pierce blazed in 1972 and they've brought it to the next level in the 21st century. I agree. I would agree very much. So I, I've met Seth a few times and, and, oh, uh, and the films the show, are great. But... And, and if I were to recommend only one more movie, my all-time favorite small town monster movie, the one I would recommend to anybody to watch and that I would add to the essential cryptid uh, cinema list is Momo, the Missouri monster. It is a I love the setup for that. I love the work. setup. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So and, for, and for the listeners, just, that's the uh, he's basically set it up as though it's like a lost episode of of uh, something that, that never got released, but they're going right. to let it. But now you're going to get to see what they did with this. And uh, and it's about one of the strangest real Bigfoot cases out there. So, yep. And and it's what they did is they not only had the conceit of let's manufacture a 1970s film that never existed they also bring in lyle black and lyle is, as the who movie is a real is. cryptozoologist I, okay. I, and yeah. lyle is narrating the meta yeah it's all it's very layered the I, actual interviews with the yeah. actual survivors of the people who were in the community where yeah. the momo sightings happened with the fictional film that lyle is the tv host tv host, host for, for yeah <laughs> it, I, it, is a, it, it is like a brilliant it, uh, uh, autopsy of the entirety. It, of it's it's more layered than a fancy cake. It's very layered, right? It's, it's very great. layered, and so. it's a lot of fun, which is even more important with the fancy cake. Does it? It taste is good. It tastes great. Yeah, right. I'm not saying it's so, nutritious, but you'll enjoy it, right? It's so. very <laughs> nutritious, actually. So, um, so you know, that's. Uh, uh, that I think we could break if cryptid cinema, the Boggy Creek request, the second volume ends up being too big. We're going to release it as what it is. Um, but we're also going to break it into um, possibly two less expensive volumes so that people that just want to read the legend of Boggy Creek stuff can buy that black and white volume. And the people that want to read the legacy stuff, which primarily is composed of those interviews with um, contemporary filmmakers, uh, that would also be a more affordable black and white volume. We're going to play with what's possible. Part of the fun of print on demand is, you know, you can do things that no publisher would ever allow you to do. Yeah, exactly. Well, exactly. And I, I, I'm very interested in all that. I've been following print on demand since it really got started. Um, and, you know, I've got a couple of books in the work myself. You should uh, be doing it. I mean, yeah. really, it's it's the first time that the gatekeeper has re been removed. And I yeah. still work with publishers, right? I'm I'm about uh, right. We're in the middle of contracting right now on a big graphic novel project that that if it happens, uh, will be done with a mainstream publisher. I still work with publishers. My Brood book, which came out last year, you know, this was done with uh, two imprints: Electric Dreamhouse, 
which has a series called the Midnight Movie Monographs and PS Publishing. Um, and, and they're based in the United Kingdom. So I'm still working with publishers, but the fun of doing these books is um, Tim Paxson and I can make these books into precisely what we want them to be. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. So, and no, for the but- authors like yourself, Blake, uh, if you were to to interest a publisher in one of your book projects, you'd get a little tiny advance. Exactly. And maybe yeah. something on the back end. And then but be I, responsible for all the public. Sh- uh, and you're going to do everything anyway. I get to do all the PRs. Whereas, yeah, yeah, yeah. print on demand with Amazon, when you recommend it to your friends to go and buy a cryptid cinema, every month ends with a little money going into my bank account from whatever sold the month. Nice. That's wonderful. I don't have to wait six months or a year for the trickle down. Royalty. Yes. Yeah. You don't have to I, go audit. Amazon <laughs> puts it right in the bank account. And, um, and my experiment with cryptid cinema was twofold. If I put a book out there and don't promote it at all, will people buy it? I've done almost no promo on cryptid cinema. I do a little bit when it first came out. Um, and, if I take the period out of my middle name, right? It's Stephen R. Bissett. But if I take the period out, if people go on Amazon and buy Swamp Thing, it doesn't take them to Cryptid Cinema. I was curious. Could I sell a book if it wasn't associated with Swamp Thing? Yeah. And by taking the period out of my name, it did it. Nice. Any sales I get on Cryptid Cinema is because of Cryptid Cinema. It's yeah. not because you bought all the swamp things and cryptid cinema popped up on the Amazon feed because yeah. it doesn't because it's Stephen R with a period on all my mainstream books. It's R without a period on cryptid cinema, which is, you know, sort of a suicidal, stupid thing to do, but it was also a test. I wanted yeah. to see what would happen. So, well, well, hopefully you'll get a few more bucks from, from talking with me. So I hope so, please. <laughs> and thank you for, thank you for buying a copy. And I'm, I hope you enjoyed it. It was mainly meant to be a I, fun, it, pleasurable this, read. It was like the best present for me that I didn't know I was giving myself. You know hey, what I mean? There like, you go. I mean, it was it was <laughs> such a delight. I loved it. So, um, and I'm sure the audience will love it too. I've been I've been like see for the for the bonus material for our, our bonus. It's, it's a I call it big footage. Is the oh yeah. yeah oh yeah 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 that's the way to go yeah Bingo. So it's, it's it's just all Bigfoot movies and that's just something if I do for the patrons uh, special but uh, yeah I, this is I just love this was I, I'm proud to have this on the shelf and look forward to the other volumes now I'm going to do something that's unfair to you which is that's all right bring it on I did I didn't prepare you for this because I didn't know how long we we're going to get to talk but that's okay in the typical monster talk interview. We end with our signature question, and that is the completely unfair question. You're going to hate me. Okay. What's your favorite monster? Oh, that's easy. Oh, My is it? My favorite monster, the creature from the Black Lagoon. Awesome. Okay. My absolute Why? favorite monster. Yeah. I don't know. You know, like, I my favorite monster should be a Ray Harry Hawson monster because, you know, the, the formative experience in my life was seeing beasts from 20,000 fathoms on TV when I was like four. Yeah. Um, but for some reason, the Gill man just like captured me when I was He's, a kid. It's a, it's a good costume. It holds up lovely. It's, it's not nice. just the costume. It's like, he became this weird surrogate me, this weird projection of, of, you know, my primal self. Like when I would, when I, when I'd be angry when I was a kid, I, you know, I wished I was the Gill man. <laughs> <laughs> or, or if I was in the woods and I was just like tearing through the woods when I was five and six, it's like I was a gill man. You wow. Know? I don't know what it was. It was like this really primal, instinctive thing. I think part of it might be, you know, growing up in, in the part of New England I grew up in, in northern Vermont, we, we weren't allowed to have pets when I was a kid, right? Because my, my mom and my dad had both come from families uh, uh, that had, you know, 12 living brothers and sisters and my mom grew up on a farm and pets just were like vermin to them. So we didn't have a dog. We didn't have a cat. So, you know, going out every spring, getting frogs, eggs, bringing them home, putting them in an aquarium, nursing them through tadpole, letting them go when they were frogs. So I think the frog thing was part of it for me, you know, because that was the only living life form that I had that kind of regular relationship with yeah that 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 was real you know that wasn't imaginary that was real um 
And and I was that kind of kid. You know, I was the kid that picked up the rocks and what's under oh, yeah. the rocks. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. My Quad brother and I and, caught painted and, turtles yeah. and we actually, you know, built this big pen in the backyard and raised painted turtles nice. that whole year. They laid eggs, you know. Yeah. So I think the creature, the gill man, you know, kind of it was the fantasy aspect projection of those bonds I felt with nature as a kid with primarily amphibians and reptiles that were around us in a natural environment. Um, and, and I, I think part of it was there were no, like there's no venomous reptiles in Vermont. Like we didn't have to be afraid of the snakes. We, yeah. We well, that is heads. nice. We, yeah, we, you yeah. know, I guess rattlesnakes have been found on camel sump in one other location, but you know, they weren't around. So I wasn't afraid yeah of of them and that also meant the creature was like you know my buddy <laughs> nice that is fantastic <laughs> he is still the monster i most love to draw you know if, if you're on my facebook page uh, you know the two monsters i draw the most and and put up sketches of on uh my facebook page would be swamp thing because that's what people want me to draw but the creature is the one i love to draw you know that's so. great so well that's so a great pretty, answer yeah yeah, yeah. Well, and it also ended up tying into all the things I ended up loving growing up, you know, Lovecraft. Oh yeah. It was plugged right into there. Um, you know, I, my, I remember dad and mom taking us to see uh, the incredible Mr. Limpet with Don. Knox. Oh, I love that movie. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a guy that wants to turn into a fish. Hey, that, yeah, yeah. that was me. Right. That one in the ghost of Mr. <laughs> Chicken. I, th- I don't know why you, I always, I love the ghost of Mr. Yeah, yeah. Chicken. <laughs> you know? uh, but, and I think it's part of the reason shape of water hits such a deep, reservoir for me it was like that was the creature movie i always wished existed and now it does and that's awesome i, just, I don't see any downside to it you know well so. that okay so i have to end this uh yeah. let me let, let's do it as though because there's going to be a short version of this for the conference oh yeah so, oh yeah so you, you can do whatever you want with all this we uh-oh. haven't we haven't done anything that anybody would object to. No, no, I don't think so. Not at all. No, I think people are going to love this. So, uh, so let's on behalf of the adventures in Porte sci-fi fest, I want to say thank you for taking time to talk to us. This has been great. My and great then, pleasure. On behalf of monster talk. I absolutely love this conversation. Thank you so much. We will definitely have to have you back on. Yeah. Now, my great pleasure. So normally I have a co-host. I don't know why I'm doing this. She lives in Denver. I live in Georgia. But anyway, my co-host, uh, Dr. Karen Stolzno, uh, would normally be a part of this. So, uh, Oh, let's do that sometime. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll have to have her. She would, she would dig this. This would be great. So great. I, it was really wonderful talking to you. I, obviously, you love this stuff at least as much as me, if not way more. So that's great. So I may have a few years of love up on you. Yeah, yeah, you get, you, yeah I'll time. earn into yeah. it. Give me time. So. <laughs> <laughs> Blake, this has been great. Uh, and Likewise. Thanks for inviting me in. I'm really glad that Russ suggested it. And um, we'll do the Q&A on the day, right? That's Sounds why. like it. Yeah, that's exciting. Great. All right. Okay.